Hello everyone! At long last, we are about to begin the series on dinosaur phylogeny, but first we need to understand a few things. The major discoveries that laid down the foundations of modern paleontology, and that our knowledge of the fossil record has greatly increased since Charles Darwin penned Origin of Species. So let's jump right in. <laughs> Ever since the dawn of civilization, fossilized remains were known by humans. However, humans rarely could identify what they were, which was especially the case with fossils of fauna that no one had ever seen alive. These seemingly petrified creatures were often associated with the monsters of ancient mythology and folklore. Otherwise, with the exception of the occasional collector and folk healer using the grinded powder for medicine, fossils were seen as rather insignificant for a very long time. After the Enlightenment, scientists were finally beginning to pay more attention to the rocks and the fossils within them. Using the principles of stratigraphy established by Nicholas Steno, William Smith discovered in the early 19th century that each strata contains a unique set of fossils, and he also saw that these succeeded each other in a predictable way, even at different locations. He called this observation the principle of faunal succession, which became the basis for identifying strata to different geological time periods. Around the same time, Georges Cuvier argued that extinction was a real phenomenon. While most believed that just as new life forms did not appear, existing ones did not go extinct either. However, more evidence for the reality of extinction piled up over the years largely due to a fossil collector named Mary Anning, who co-discovered the first ichthyosaur when she was just 12 years old. She later discovered the first plesiosaur and the first pterosaur outside of Germany, just to name a few examples. Her contributions were invaluable to science and they could not be overstated, but she unfortunately didn't receive much recognition at the time. These and more discoveries led Georges Cuvier to suggest that there had been an age of reptiles before the age of mammals, a time when these reptiles lived and were the dominant animal species. It became increasingly unlikely that these bizarre creatures were still around in some remote part of the world. They were indeed extinct. But, the advancements made in paleontology didn't end there. Still in the early 19th century, Charles Darwin circumnavigated the world on the HMS Beagle from 1831 to 1836, gathering specimens from South America, the Galapagos Islands, Australia, and other places. Among other things, he gathered fossils and specimens of extant species, figured out how coral reefs and atolls form, and developed his early thoughts on what would eventually come to be called evolution. He did all of this in a time when extremely little was known of the fossil record. In fact, Darwin spent a portion of origin apologizing for the paucity of the record. In the years hence, though, we've uncovered far more fossil species than anything Darwin could have ever dreamed. Now, just how few fossils were known when Darwin traveled the world? Well, for starters, only two fossil mammals were known from South America. The giant sloth Megatherium and a proboscidean originally misidentified as a mastodon. It would later come to be identified as the Gomphothere Cuvieronius. Darwin uncovered yet more fossils of Megatherium, as well as fossils of mammals that would later come to be identified as Mylodon Psilidotherium, Glossotherium, Glyptodon, Neosclerocalyptus, Equus neogeus, Nodiomastodon, Toxodon, Actinomys, Pedotherium, and Macrachenia. Finding specimens like the sloth Megatherium and the armadillo-like Glyptodon caused Darwin to think that the modern sloth and armadillo, respectively, were related to these ancient forms. He reasoned that they weren't the direct ancestors of the modern animals, but rather shared a common ancestor with them. This conclusion has been extensively borne out through paleogenomic and fossil data. For example, the 2015 paper, Collagen Sequence Analysis of the Extinct Giant Ground Sloths, Lestodon and Megatherium, explains that the two- and three-toed sloths are sister to each other, and that Lestodon is more closely related to them than to Megatherium. And, mitochondrial DNA collected from the fossil Glyptodon didicurus has placed it among the armadillos, close to the fairy, giant, three-banded, and naked-tailed armadillos, according to the 2016 paper, The Phylogenetic Affinities of the Extinct Glyptodonts. 
As for Toxodon, Pedotherium, and Macrachenia, they have all turned out to be members of a clade of specifically South American placental mammals called Meridiungulata, which Darwin didn't know. We discussed in Island Biogeography that South America produced a number of mammals convergently similar to mammals we're more familiar with. This convergence has made it difficult in the past to classify these mammals, but here paleoproteomic data has come to the rescue. The 2015 paper, Ancient Proteins, Resolved the Evolutionary History of Darwin's South American Ungulates, demonstrates that Meridiungulata is sister to the Perissodactyls, the horses, rhinos, and tapirs. Now, fossil data roots the Perissodactyl tree at about 56 million years ago, which Darwin didn't and couldn't know. After all, using radioactive isotopes to date objects wasn't first demonstrated until 1907. Therefore, Darwin couldn't know the absolute ages of any fossil creatures he discovered. What researchers prior to Darwin, such as Charles Lyell, had worked out though was that the Earth had to be at least millions of years old based on observations of modern geologic formations. This is how the concept of uniformitarianism was worked out. Darwin reasoned that organismal traits were modified over successive generations and this process is occurring today as in the distant past. Therefore, we should find fossil representatives of the transition between different groups of organisms. He explained this concept in origin and later finds have definitely vindicated his theory. One such species discovered just two years after the publication of origin was Archaeopteryx lithographica from Germany, demonstrating a link between birds and the colloquially called reptiles. This find so enthralled Darwin that he included it in later versions of origin. We know now that birds are highly derived theropods with groups such as Enantiornithines and Hesperorniths living alongside the non-avian dinosaurs. But the record of fossil birds in Darwin's day was almost non-existent. In fact, the fossil record of dinosaurs was almost non-existent. Richard Owen, not that Owen, proposed the clade Dinosauria in 1842, just 17 years prior to origin based on the remains of three large reptiles from England named Iguanodon, Megalosaurus, and Hylaeosaurus. Iguanodon and Hylaeosaurus grouped together into the order Ornithischia, or bird hip dinosaurs, based on the shape of their hips, while Megalosaurus is a theropod being a member of the unfortunately named Saurischia. That means birds with their bird hips originated from the lizard hip dinosaurs, some of whom had bird hips though. Few other dinosaurs were named in the 17-year interval, such as Pelorosaurus, Massospondylus, and Troodon, with Astrodon, Compsognathus, Hadrosaurus, and Solidosaurus being named the same year as Origin's publication. But the discovery of dinosaurs and other prehistoric creatures didn't really pick up until 1877, when the so-called Bone Wars began between Charles Othniel Marsh and Edward Drinker Cope. The clade Sauropoda, including all the long-necked dinosaurs, wasn't even named until 1878, which was years after origin. And that's one of the three main clades of dinosaurs. Sauropods found prior to origin were misidentified as giant sea reptiles. New discoveries caused paleontologists to group dinosaurs into allosaurs, tyrannosaurs, stegosaurs, ankylosaurs, titanosaurs, and various other groups, all of which were unknown to Darwin. Thanks to the predictive power of the theory of evolution, the more we discover, the more we understand where and when animal groups first evolved, which in turn informs us as to where to look for more fossils of the same group to make more discoveries. A good example of such a discovery feedback loop is whales. When there were no known fossils of early whale species, scientists did not have a clue where to look for them. It took one lucky discovery in Pakistan and now we have discovered dozens of species from the same area and others filling the evolutionary tree of early whales. The same thing is happening across paleontology including dinosaurs with the rate of newly named genera increasing over the years. As a result, hundreds of other dinosaur species have since been discovered, forming an increasingly detailed picture of their evolution, and we'll look at some of these in the later videos of this series. Since Darwin knew barely anything about dinosaurs, he wouldn't have known about the ancestors of dinosaurs nor would he have known about their relationship to our own ancestors. He also didn't know about the ancestors of humans. The only non-human hominin in his day was the Neanderthal, stem amniotes, the great fossil record of amphibians, the stem tetrapods, various non-nathostome chordates, 
fossils that link together clades of invertebrates, and certainly not Ediacaran fauna. The list goes on and on, but that's where I'm going to end it. The next video of this series is going to address the ancestors of dinosaurs. So now you see that our understanding of the fossil record has greatly changed since Darwin. And thanks for watching, I'll see you next time.